Medical Specialists Associates, making medical education more accessible. Uh, welcome, listeners, to our MSA podcast. I'm Nazir Habib, uh, internal medicine and uh, critical care medicine. And I'm joined by my colleague, Chris Vespopoulos, who's also uh, a critical care physician and anesthesiologist. And I'd like to let him introduce himself. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I'm a critical care anesthesiologist. And I think one of the things that I, I love most about uh, critical care medicine is the varied backgrounds that uh, that we have in our field, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Habib being medicine based, myself being anesthesia, but then we have ER and surgical, and I think we all bring you know unique perspectives uh, to the field, and you know this is an exciting topic for me to talk about when we talk about innovation and with something uh, uh, in reference to uh, the use of ketamine, because I feel as if it's something that I have to contribute um, you know to my colleagues, and then in turn I look forward to hearing what they have to contribute to me. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so, you know, one of the questions that comes up in the ICU very frequently when we go to intubate a hemodynamically unstable patient who may have cardiac issues or septic shock or CHF or hypotension, and, you know, there's great concern about using the usual rapid sequence intubation medications that we are, our colleagues often use, including narcotics, propofol, benzodiazepines. Um, can you share your concerns uh, regarding the medications that we use for rapid sequence intubation and uh, how to avoid some of these post-intubation uh, hypotension and arrhythmias? Sure. I mean, I, I think what I'd like to say, you know, uh, to broaden uh, maybe the questions a little bit outside of rapid sequence uh, intubation is, um, you know, once you have intubated so many patients as an anesthesiologist, you know, and you've overcome that primary, you know, learning objective, which is being able to intubate, you know, then of course, what you do is you look to refine the technique a little bit. You look at the broader picture, you know, of what you are trying to accomplish. And so if you had a patient with an intracranial bleed, you know, perhaps maybe we'd be using very high dosages of opioids, maybe such as 500 micrograms, uh, of fentanyl and a bolus, um, because we're really worried about that patient having no response, you know, to the intubation to increase, you know, ICP. But really, you know, safety um, is the overwhelming thing that I think that uh, a critical care anesthesiologist looks at, and their ability to have success. But the ability to have success also often involves having a game plan to back out. Um, of a situation. And what I mean by backing out of a situation is because even though we have tremendous confidence in our ability to intubate, um, we are still only human. And we're worried about that one patient that maybe we have a difficulty with um, intubation. Um, and we have to maybe revert to bag mask. And perhaps maybe we are not at an institution that have maybe has something such as Sugamidex, you know, to whereas we might paralyze a patient for intubation and then find ourselves in a situation to where we cannot intubate. Um, and now we are going to have to have a prolonged mask ventilation, which is very difficult, you know, to do for excessive periods of time. And then that leads us into the question of ketamine. Um, and one of the primary reasons why, you know, many of us are big fans of ketamine is because for the most part, it does not produce apnea. And, you know, I'm very careful of my words when I say for the most part, because, um, you never know if an individual might have maybe central apneic disease or otherwise. And the normal agents that don't produce apnea, such as ketamine or Presidex, you know, might respond in different ways to those very select individuals. And so broadly speaking, we're saying it does not produce apnea, but you still have to be careful and just be ready just in case you have that one in, you know, X number of individuals. And so really one of the big things about ketamine then is going to be that ability to not produce um, apnea. And that could be very useful. So if you find yourself in a situation to where you're going to intubate, say, a morbidly obese 
um, individual and you're not really quite so sure if you can get the airway or not, it's not really quite an emergency. You might not have the availability for backup. All of a sudden looking at ketamine, you know, as an option is a very attractive option. And I'll pause there for a minute just to kind of break this up. I mean, there's really so much more to say, but um, that's that's probably the one of the bigger items to mention at first here. You know, the uh, non-ability to produce apnea uh, with a ketamine induction. So what I'm hearing you say, Chris, then, is that you don't necessarily use the same cocktail, uh, which we call rapid sequence intubation in emergency situations on every patient, you customize and you tailor the medications based on is it a neurological situation, the seizure, intracranial bleed versus sepsis, septic shock. But the advantage of ketamine may be that you can keep the patient relatively awake. How do you, first of all, how do you give the ketamine, do you, you give it in small doses or do you give it a big bolus or do you titrate it? And do you often combine ketamine with a sedative like Versed or Propofol? Some people talk about Ketofol. Can you talk about your experiences, your, your um, expertise in this area? Sure, I think the easiest context here is uh, for me to put this uh, in a story for a real patient uh, type of encounter. So let's go to an individual that I had mentioned you know, just in a uh, you know, short while ago to where we have an individual to where you are uh, called to the bedside to intubate and you are not quite certain if you're going to be able to intubate this patient um, and you don't have any backup. Um, you also don't have the availability of Sugambidex, which is not at all institutions uh, or maybe downstairs in the operating room and you're in the ICU and you don't have easy access to it. So, you know, you're really thinking primarily of safety. Um, and so uh, from the get-go, you would consider ketamine here because it will maintain the, bre the patient breathing spontaneously. And in that particular instance, uh, intubation dosages are going to be in the neighborhood of anywhere from one to three milligrams, maybe 3.5 milligrams per kilogram. Um, we uh, tend to go towards the two or three uh, milligrams, um, you know, more often you know, closer to three. Um, and then we could bolus um, that particular medication. Now, in bolusing that particular medication, what you will notice is, is that the patient will still be able to move. They'll have you know, full pharyngeal reflexes. They'll just be unconscious, um, but for the most part, still breathing by themselves. Now, in a rapid sequence uh, or a quick intubation type scenario, what you don't have to worry about so much at that time is the hypersalivation that happens um, you know, with ketamine. If this was a different scenario where you were doing a fiber optic bronchoscopy and you're using ketamine uh, in that regard, or just a regular bronchoscopy, and you had time, you might consider you know, uh, including something like 0.1 milligrams of glycopyrrolate um, uh, as an agent. Of course, glycopyrrolate has the advantage of not crossing the blood-brain barrier and further contributing to delirium in some of our elderly patients as compared to atropine. That's why we use it more often you know, in the anesthesia world, but atropine will, will accomplish the same goal. If you happen to be fortunate and you're intubating a patient in the ICU that already is concomitantly on Presidex, what is a little appreciated is that Presidex is an anti salog itself. Um, and so you don't have to worry about that. You can go ahead and push the ketamine. You're not going to get the hypersalivation because of the ketamine. Um, so now what is a, a, a huge advantage again is that patient now is maintaining breathing spontaneously. But what could be more difficult for some individuals who have not had as much experience with intubation is that having full pharyngeal reflexes in that individual and even having them having the ability to meet, to move, might present a difficulty for someone in intubating you know, that patient. Um, and so uh, one point that I wanna emphasize here is that if you push the ketamine first, and then maybe you just allow something reasonable like you know, 15 to 30 seconds uh, to go by or so, maybe 30 seconds could be a lot, but 15 to maybe 20 seconds, if you chase that with propofol thereafter, say 100 milligrams of propofol, say half the normal innovating dose that you would normally use, here's the key. That patient will have 
pharyngeal relaxation. Um, so that'll be nice. They'll stop moving, but they will continue to breathe. And that's something that kind of confuses people because ketamine will be a respiratory stimulant. And often what we'll do in the operating room is we mix ketamine and propofol together, or we give the ketamine first. And if we're doing what's called a total intravenous anesthetic, which normally just involves uh, using propofol for, low, for high, high concentrations, you'll notice that you can start running propofol at 200 mics per kilo per minute, 250 mics per kilo per minute, and the patient will not become apneic if you have used ketamine ahead of time. So that is an illustration of mixing and maxing these drugs to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish here, the primary thing of being safety. Now, the beauty of this scenario is that you pushed your ketamine, so you pushed your propofol for optimization, and let's say you still had a little bit of difficulty um, uh, in intubating, that patient's still breathing spontaneous. And so you might not have to bag mask at all. They might just be fine on supplemental oxygen, uh, face mask, hypo-nasal cannula, and you might then be able to call for help um, to find other options. And so really, safety uh, is the most important thing. And so I think that's what I talk about um, in terms of uh, airway management, but maybe perhaps we can transition a little bit towards hemodynamics. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, so the question then I have is that if you're using a combination of ketamine and a little bit of propofol, especially in the hemodynamically unstable patient with septic shock, are you not going to see the post-intubation hypotension that we often see with Versed and propofol? And the second part of that is, do you need to use a paralytic? Yeah, no, you definitely don't need to use a uh, paralytic. I, I, um, uh, for uh, many uh, ICUs um, in which maybe some of the uh, critical care anesthesiologists, mostly staff, um, there's a tendency uh, towards not using uh, paralytics. Um, it's just simply uh, not needed. Um, you know, paralytics uh, come in handy and there's a role. Um, you know, there's also a balancing effect there, you know, with uh, uh, mobility, early mobility, uh, deconditioning, um, use of high dose steroids, and then using um, uh, paralytics. And so if an individual doesn't need to use them, um, then there might be advantages. You know, that being said, let's not lose sight of the primary focus, which is a successful intubation. And so if you have to use it, you, you have to use it. That being said, um, there are many ICUs that don't allow the use of succinyl choline uh, at all, uh, especially since now uh, Sugambidex for early reversal is available for your um, uh, non-depolarizing agents. And that's because many times you're not really quite sure where someone is on the spectrum of deconditioning and how much upregulation they have had of their acetylcholine receptors. Um, and I have you know, personally seen hyperkalemia uh, in individuals that you otherwise would not have suspected um, that they had that problem. So having a safety effect of just not using succinylcholine in those situations. But in terms of hemodynamics of, uh, of ketamine, it's really important to remember that ketamine is an indirect sympathetic activator. Um, um, and so, uh, uh, what I mean by that is that when you give ketamine, it is going to rev up the sympathetic nervous system to release more norepinephrine and epinephrine, uh, out of, uh, out of its vesicles. And that is how you get your hypertensive effect. However, ketamine itself is a cardiac depressant. And so what we talk about in the literature is, um, what about if we had a patient who was completely catecholamine depleted, right? Say a patient, that patient that's in septic shock, they've been on three pressors for seven days um, or even just a few days and they have no catecholamine reserve of their own. And for some reason you need to reintubate that patient and you push ketamine. Well, in that particular instance, that person is not gonna be able to have their own catecholamine stores and surge and you're only gonna have pure cardiac depression and you could see someone there brady down, maybe even going to asystole uh, in that particular instance. But for the most part, in other individuals who are not catecholamine depleted, you do see a hypertensive uh, response. And that is one of the beauties then of mixing 
ketamine with propofol because, of course, propofol will induce hypotension. And here, what you're trying to do is minimize um, the uh, the two particular effects, which is something that we commonly do in the operating. We'll mix drugs um, such as propofol and ketamine, or maybe propofol and levofed, or propofol and phenylephrine to accomplish the same goals. Thank you, Chris. So that's an excellent review and perspective from anesthesia to help our colleagues uh, in the emergency room and ICU use some safety precautions to uh, get especially the difficult airway. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And perhaps we can expand on some of these issues in another podcast uh, next week or thereafter. Thank you again, Chris. I'd love to. Thank you. All right. For more information, please visit our website at www.med-specialists.net. You can also find us on YouTube as Medical Specialists Associates. Thanks for listening.